And we are back. Welcome to part two of Gamergate 2, Know Your Past. What we are doing here is getting a grasp of what happened in the past before we tackle current events like Sweet Baby Inc. If you haven't seen part one yet, I do recommend checking it out because it explains the dominoes and the events leading into Gamergate. While here in part two, we will be tackling the meat of what happened. So I'm going to run down what I believe to be the major events in chronological order. I'd like to note that I'm not going to focus too much on the harassment, doxing and death threats on either side of the Gamergate discussion. And if I do go into detail on any specific harassment attempt, then it is in aid of explaining further actions. I think focusing on the harassment rather than the core issues and events is an extremist trap in the sense that radical ideals require there to be sides. And once you can attribute actions to a collective and then effectively dehumanize the individuals within it, you then have ammunition and a call to action as a means of recruitment. Very simply, extremists create their own opposition, escalate issues, and the most effective means of escalation in this particular case was to keep score of social injustices made against you and then leave your own actions off the scorecard. In my books, if you're going to keep score, you need to do it right, and literally no one is going to do that, so I digress. Here we go. Anita Sarkeesian makes her splash in the gaming world. Anita Sarkeesian is harassed and threatened online. We then have Zoe Quinn releasing Depression Quest. The Zoe post is released. Zoe Quinn is harassed and threatened online. Gamers cry foul play after years of unaddressed distrust boils over into a demand to clean house and reform. Kotaku's Steven Totillo, chief editor, reports that he has checked the timelines and talked to Nathan Grayson, confirming that there was no sex trade for positive review and that the only article he wrote with Kotaku that mentioned Zoe Quinn predated the known romantic relationship. Zoe Quinn allegedly starts to conduct a mass DMCA takedown campaign on YouTube of anyone covering the topic. This results in the Streisand effect, causing large YouTuber personalities like Total Biscuit to weigh in on the discussion, and then subsequently entire threads across multiple social media platforms are deleted and banned seemingly in unison, causing further suspicion and harassment. So we can see that the relationship between gamers and games media was quite flammable. Anita Sarkeesian was the powder keg. The Zoe post was the spark. The mass censorship agitated suspicions, but the mass release of the Gamers Are Dead articles beginning as of August 28, 2014, many of which are cited as sources for the Wikipedia page, would be viewed as the battle line being drawn. The first one hit August 28th at 10 a.m titled Gamers Don't Have To Be Your Audience, Gamers Are Over. The second one, An Awful Week To Care About Video Games. Third, The Death Of Gamers And The Women That Killed Them. Fourth, A Guide To Ending Gamers. Fifth, We Might Be Witnessing The Death Of An Identity. Sixth, Gaming Is Leaving Gamers Behind. Seventh, Sexism, Misogyny And Online Attacks. It's A Horrible Time To Consider Yourself A Gamer. Eighth, it's dangerous to go alone. Why gamers are so angry. Ninth, the end of gamers. These all came out on the same day. This carries on to a list of 12 core articles referred to as the gamers or dead articles, though there were 18 that came out that were relevant to the topic and sentiment in total. Okay, but how bad could it be, right? Let me read you some quotes from the article titled Gamers Don't Have To Be Your Audience, Gamers Are Over by Lee Alexander, which was the first of these articles to be released. To quote, it's young men queuing with plush mushroom hats and backpacks and jutting promo poster roles, queuing passionately for hours at events around the world to see the things that marketers want them to see, to find out whether they should buy things or not. They don't know how to dress or behave. Television cameras pan across these listless queues and often catch the expressions of people who don't quite know why they themselves are standing there. Games culture is a petri dish of people who know so little about how human social interaction and professional life works that they can concoct online wars about social justice or games journalism ethics straight-faced and cause genuine human consequences because of video games. 
end quote. And later in the article, to quote, Suddenly, a generation of lonely basement kids had marketers whispering in their ears that they were the most important commercial demographic of all time. Suddenly, they started wearing shiny blouses and pinned bikini babes onto everything they made, started making games that sold the promise of high-octane masculinity to kids just like them. By the turn of the millennium, those were games' only main cultural signposts. Have money, have women, get a gun, and then a bigger gun. Be an outcast. Celebrate that. Defeat anyone that threatens you. End quote. Lee caps off the article with this quote. Gamer isn't just a dated demographic label that most people increasingly prefer not to use. Gamers are over. That's why they're so mad. These obtuse shit slingers, these wailing hyper consumers, these childish internet arguers, they are not my audience. They don't have to be yours. There is no side to be on. There is no debate to be had. End quote. Perhaps if you're unfamiliar with gaming culture you may not realize this, but being a gamer in many cases was something that wasn't really cool. Not when I was growing up at least. In fact, and there is some statistical merit to this, there's a lot of people that play video games because they are just not winning in real life. People knew this back in the day and that's why you could be branded as a loser, a nerd, a virgin, etc etc. Thankfully that's far less the case nowadays and I'm very happy for that. But to read this deluge of articles, I mean perhaps you may have suspected that gaming media talked down to you, but this framed it in no uncertain terms. Games media saw you exactly as that stereotype. It was a moment of realization for many gamers that they weren't laughing with you, they were laughing at you. Now defenders of such articles will say it's gamers in quotation marks, it's not everyone, and some articles do make that distinction at the bottom of the page. But the timing, the time frame, the coordination and the vitriol certainly felt like a coded message and in my opinion the defense comes across as further gaslighting. Ironically, intentional or not, the Gamers Are Dead articles perfectly emulated extremist behavior. Assign the actions of individuals as the actions of a collective, assign blame to said collective, draw a battle line and call to action. So it was likely a cathartic day for the extremists, but it was really a, how do I say this? a monumental fuck up or in an elaborate conspiracy on behalf of games journalism. Now, one point is simply a point without correlation, but two points make a line. And if you've been following up to this point, all lines point at corruption. But was this actually true? Well, the allegation that Zoe Quinn slept with Nathan Grayson for positive press is not verifiably true, but it is plausible. Another line of corruption stems from one of the awards mentioned on Depression Quest's website. Depression Quest was selected as part of Indiecade 2013, where if you look at the selectors, they consist of one of the five guys Zoe Quinn slept with and a Twitter user named Lego Butts. Lego Butts is important. They play a major role in the sequel, but she's important here because both her and Zoe Quinn were openly against another feminist group trying to get funding for their project to help women in video games, which further demonstrates my point that feminists do not necessarily get along, and it can be far from peaceful. Anyways, this project was run by the fine young capitalists. They were hacked and DDoSed after some ominous tweets between Lego Butts and Zoe Quinn. Shortly after, you can see Zoe Zoe Quinn jokingly implied that they had caused the attack in a celebratory manner. Now, I'm not saying anything, but I do think this is a statement of character and it shows that Lego Butts was not a stranger to Zoe Quinn. So I ask the question, do you think it's fair that Depression Quest displays its participation award for Indiecade? Probably not, but I think many would feel that it's not like this crazy Illuminati level conspiracy. Here's the rub. Gamers saw all the actions of a conspiracy, but the verifiable evidence was weak and easily framed as petty. Game journalists refused to do further investigation into the matter and chastised their audience for the harassment of the likes of Zoe Quinn, Brianna Wu and Anita Sarkeesian. As is natural, if game journalists were not going to do their job, then others would step in to bridge the gap. Milo Yiannopoulos, a journalist for Breitbart, started to cover Gamergate with some rather scathing remarks. His first article was titled, Feminist Bullies Tearing the Video Game Industry Apart, was released September 1st, 2014. I'll read the opening paragraph to quote, It's easy to mock video gamers as dorky loners in yellowing underpants. Indeed, in previous columns I've done it myself, occasionally at length. 
But the more you learn about the latest scandal in the game's industry, the more you start to sympathize with the frustrated male stereotype because an army of sociopathic feminist programmers and campaigners abetted by achingly politically correct American tech bloggers are terrorizing the entire community lying, bullying, and manipulating their way around the internet for profit and attention." End quote. Now Milo is far from a neutral voice, he certainly has some controversial views, but it would be a mistake to attack his work in this particular article because he does a good job of actually representing the actual concerns of the people that align themselves with Gamergate. Many criticisms that are laid against this article point out that Breitbart is essentially a tabloid website, that it has a conservative bias, Milo's views on transgender issues, that he wasn't a gamer, that he criticized games in the past, yada yada yada, and like, Okay, cool. So what is wrong with the article? To which I think people can only really take issue with the tone. Or they go full mask off and start screaming misogyny at the clouds. I think the strongest argument you could make is that it further defines the us versus them mentality. But I'd also suggest that it was actually a step toward a much healthier discourse and had a fair amount of articles similar to this one come out from Games Media, it would have never have reached this point. Now there are voices in support of Gamergate. Christina Hoff Sommers, also known as Based Mom, known for the Factual Feminist, released two YouTube videos titled Are Video Games Sexist and What Critics of Gamergate Get Wrong? Again, you're going to see very similar criticisms. Christine is not a gamer. She's a conservative. She's not a real feminist. She's in it for the money. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that Christina Hoff Sommers uses studies to back her claims. So again, I must ask, what is the actual error in what she says? More screaming at the clouds, I think. I think finally we should mention YouTuber Total Biscuit. Sadly, this legend is no longer with us as he lost his battle with cancer in 2018. Total Biscuit was extremely consumer oriented and in terms of gamer culture, he was well loved by the gaming community. And in many ways, he was really seen as an icon for improving gaming culture. The efforts of his advocacy helped lead to many of the accessibility features we see in games today, like colorblind settings and field of view sliders. I'm not saying that he was so responsible but he was certainly a part of it. Total Biscuit used his platform in order to steer discussion toward the issues of ethics in both game development and media. In particular, he carried out and participated in multiple interviews with people on both sides of the discussion. Steven Totillo from Kotaku comes to mind. If ever there was a spokesperson for the side of Gamergate, it would have been Total Biscuit. Though again, I think that would be disrespectful to his intentions because when listening to his interviews, he repeatedly stated that he believed that the problem was that there were sides and there wasn't a discussion. Out of the three prominent figures that were lumped on the side of Gamergate, it was only Milo who had the expertise and means to conduct an investigation, and that's certainly what he did. On September 22nd, Milo released an ominous article titled, They're On To Us. Gaming journalists respond to critics in newly revealed Game Journal Pros emails. Milo would continue to drip feed leaked emails from Game Journal Pros until eventually dumping the entire email chain online along with most of its members. Game Journal Pros was a secret mailing list across multiple establishments instigated by Kyle Orland. That's right, the same Kyle Orland from Ars Technica that reviewed Depression Quest. And that's not all, but we'll get to that. So which games media sites were implicated by Games Journal Pros? Well, would you believe it? Just about everyone except IGN. And was there collusion? Perhaps not in this strict sense. I'm going to play a clip of an interview by Greg Lisby, a lawyer who specializes in ethics in journalism. <laughs> Would maintaining a friendship with a journalistic source outside of, of the field be a breach of journalism ethics? And if it's not a breach of journalism ethics, you are walking a very fine line. It comes at what point that professional relationship crosses the line. And usually the point it crosses the line is the point at which you consciously or unconsciously start doing things for the other person. Would you say that funding a source's creative projects crosses that line? Absolutely. It's best maintain that kind of professional relationship and make sure that they don't get close. Right. Um, Impartiality. I mean, first off, you have to, it, there has to be a clear understanding of who you are. I mean, your obligation is to write, we hope, truth that is newsworthy. And so if at any point you start messing with either of those criteria, that's either it's not truthful 
or you try to make something newsworthy that's not newsworthy, you run into problems. Do these rules also apply for editorial writing as well as news writing, or are they held to a different standard? I would say that they apply doubly to editorial writing, because editorial writing is an opinion, and why should I trust your opinion if I don't believe that it is objective? So I've read the entire chain available, and here's my personal analysis. I think Kyle Orland had a thing for Zoe Quinn, or at the very least, his behavior along with Ben Kuchero, who also used to work at Ars Technica, were very sympathetic to Zoe Quinn's position. I certainly could not sense any neutrality in how they talked about her. The first thing Kyle Orland does is share her pastebin on her plead for the Zoe post to not be reported and how she refuses to give comment on the allegations, claiming that it is a non-story and not important to the industry which is a clever PR strategy considering it would literally be impossible to spin Zoe's personal behavior as any more than deplorable. But let's be charitable. Let's look at how Kyle frames this. To quote, I understand where Quinn is coming from. I want to respect her desire for privacy. At the same time, I do feel that there is some legitimate public interest in a game developer being attacked by the internet. At the same time as that, I don't want to in essence reward the jerks doing this by giving their issue any attention at all. I'm not even going to give the bullshit journalism ethics excuse for these attacks the time of day. Even if there is any merit to those accusations, the sickening facts of these attacks easily overwhelms it." End quote. So again, we have another admission that there is merit to the accusations. I mean, yes, this is a villain monologuing their exploits in real time. So let's continue. To quote, I would love to use my platform to reproach this kind of behavior, but that would go against Quinn's valid and understandable desire not to have their personal matter publicized by the media. So what's to be done? Maybe we should just stick to Twitter to boost the signal on this one, rather than our front pages. Quinn seemed initially okay with people retweeting her statement. But then she took down the original Tumblr post, so who knows. Maybe we should get a public letter of support going around decrying these kinds of personal attacks, signed by as many sympathetic journalists, developers as we can. Maybe we should use this as an excuse to give more attention to her work. I know I've been meaning to review Depression Quest since its Steam release. Very interested to hear what the rest of you think. End quote. So yes, this isn't a command or collusion, but it is an attempt to guide the group in a unified manner, which is hardly impartial and extremely inappropriate. The conversation moves on when Greg Tito from The Escapist mentions that they have an active forum discussion about the Zoe post and members of the group immediately dogpile on Greg Tito. Greg Tito holds his position on free speech and the discussion comes to an end with this by Ben Kachira. To quote, Really disappointed in that response, Greg, but I'm going to end the discussion on it here to maintain civility." End quote. While I'm glad that Greg Tito didn't fold on his stance, there was certainly a lot of right think in the responses of the other journalists that accused Greg Tito of giving harassment a home. The conversation continues on and on about Zoe Quinn. It's incredible on how much of a non-story it is, yet they can seem to go on forever about it. Chris Darlin then joins the fray and he says this, to quote, I think this is disgusting and not worth any space from any outlet. The guy who wrote that post sounds deranged. We've all had our hearts broken in our 20s, but most of us just complain to our friends. I can't imagine sending an internet mob against anyone I've ever dated, no matter how bent I was about it afterwards." End quote. I think this displays a lack of empathy toward Aaron. I think most people have been cheated on at least once, but I don't think that most people have been cheated on with five guys, girls, whatever. Never mind the evidence provided leaning heavily toward emotional abuse. Furthermore, if the exposure was not fair to Zoe Quinn, it certainly was not fair to the wives of the two of the five guys that did not know until Aaron acted. Now, am I saying that Aaron is justified? No, I don't think so, but I think the intention of trying to warn people by saying, hey, this girl ruined my life, don't let her ruin yours, is understandable. Also, the implication that he sent a mob against her is purely an allegation with no evidence behind it. He goes on to talk about the escapers for a bit and then surmises that the reason that people are acting the way they are are acting is because they don't have anyone around them to tell them to grow up. Do I need to quote Nathan Grayson again? Bleep bloop. What we're seeing is this group mentality being reinforced over and over again. Protect Zoe Quinn, silence opposition, gamers are babies. Some might say picky babies, but we'll get to that. Kyle Orlin brings up that Zoe Quinn is getting a lot of Patreons and then links her Patreon. To which I'm like, Kyle, geez, 
I, I thought this was a non-story. This is where it gets interesting. Ryan Smith then asks a question and I'm gonna read the whole thing. To quote, wow, this whole thing makes me feel very old, lordy. So I definitely don't think anyone's sex life should be news, and I certainly wouldn't write about it on a site. But quick question, how did some of you decide to publish the Josh Mattingly story from earlier this year? That appeared to be based on private conversation about sex. Where do you see the line being drawn? And how do you feel about the Snapchat CEO emails from college being a story? I was also wondering if when some of you published stories about Zoe Quinn's harassment, did you actually ask for evidence of said harassment or just go with what she wrote on Twitter?" End quote. Now, if this was a forum of professionals, I would expect a cordial response, as I think this is a cordial question. Unless, of course, you did something wrong. Here are the responses and I'll add my thoughts. To quote Sarah Leboeuf, sorry, I don't know how to say it. Uh, Pretty big difference between a private conversation about sex and sexual harassment, which is what the Mattingly situation was, end quote. Sarah isn't answering the question, where do you draw the line and did you ask for evidence? Jason Schreier, to quote, If you don't see the difference between a story about a journalist sending crude sexual messages to a game developer and a story about a game developer allegedly cheating on her boyfriend, I'm not sure what to tell you. End quote. Again, didn't answer either question and created a straw man. Ben Kuchera, to quote, So you're comparing writing about someone who sexually harassed a female developer, which is a disgraceful way to act, and covering someone who is being victimized to the point of not feeling safe in her home? Is that the real argument? you're trying to make?" End quote. No, that wasn't the argument he was trying to make. I thought you were a journalist. But I mean, do you see what I mean here? The language used is overly concerned with Zoe Quinn's well-being. Ryan then reiterates that he was asking where the line was, but dropped the question about the evidence. Kyle Orland responds to quote, between the harassers and the victims of harassment. End quote. I wouldn't call this a professional response, it doesn't belong in the conversation. Your name is Kyle, not Bruce Wayne. Jason Schreier doubles down on his straw man, Ben Kuchera gaslights Ryan further by telling him that the answer is obvious and refuses to give him an answer. Ryan Smith reframes his question a third time, but is never answered. James Fudge and Britton Peel discuss their interest in covering the copyright claims on YouTube, but then give long drawn out excuses as to the difficulty of reporting on it, not having the required expertise, wanting to avoid talking about Zoe Quinn, more defenses of Nathan Grayson not having reviewed the game. I don't know. Sounds like a lot of excuses. Isn't it a journalist's job to gain contacts that are experts on a field so they can interview them? There's a lot of circular talk here. Andrew Groen brings up the idea of sending Zoe Quinn a gift, to which I ask this question. Is this a clear breach of ethics? No shit, Sherlock, but far too many of the responders failed this test and think it's actually a good idea. Jason Schreier does speak some sense on the matter and the other journalists begin to fall in line. The discussion moves on to grapple with whether or not giving money to someone via Patreon or Kickstarter is ethical because they can't figure it out. And then finally on August 29th, the interview with Aaron Johnny dropped titled This Guy's Embarrassing Relationship Drama is Killing the Gamer Identity. And this is where the Game Journal's pros group entirely lose their minds over the quote unquote sympathetic tone of the piece. I'm just going to read you some quotes without naming names. To quote, I don't know, he seems to confirm that this kid is a gigantic fucking idiot, which had been my assumption." End quote. To quote, I don't care if this jilted moron walks around with his sad puppy dog eyes for the rest of his life. The fact of the matter is that Zoe and those closest to her were put in very real danger by the things he posted online, as in danger of physical violence. If he was with Zoe for any length of time, he would have known what a mob of angry insane misogynists were capable of, but his pissy little feelings were more important. I have no sympathy for a person that puts someone in danger like that out of pure spite. End quote. To quote, Yep, I think Danielle is right on here. I also would argue that interviewing the ex-boyfriend was probably a poor choice. But I guess it was bound to happen. And if it was going to happen anywhere, vice is the place that made sense. End quote. The next one has a quote about how sympathetic Aaron was. And it starts off with that. So, to quote, Actually, it's not hard at all. Pretty easy, in fact. Fuck that guy. End quote. To quote, I had the same reaction. This Vice article is bullshit. End quote. To quote, 
you can see him as a person with complex emotions and all that, dot dot dot. But he's also a goddamn adult, not a child. He threw a temper tantrum. That's okay when you're three, not 23. No sympathy. He can grow up. Dude comes across like a psychopath. End quote. So that's the group's reaction to this one article. There was not a single other opinion on the matter, and I'm pretty sure that if there was, it would have made them even angrier, as demonstrated by Ryan Smith. Now I get it, that was a bit of a slog, and I needed to show you this because it's definitely corruption, and I think that you could go as far as to make the allegation that some of the members were making an attempt at collusion, but I think fundamentally there are two problems here. The first is the lack of professionalism, because for the amount of non-story Zoe Quinn's personal life was they were devoting a lot of attention to it in their little group. Meanwhile, they were outwardly denouncing others for doing the same, which reflects that there was interest in the story by all parties, but no one there was being honest. Secondly, I think there's certainly a bias in empathy, and I think you can in part attribute that to the inappropriate closeness of the source, or I think they simply could not resist the damsel trope. And I say this because not one of them answered the very simple question, did you? Or did you not just take Zoe Quinn at her word? Because again, shortly before this all started, Zoe Quinn accused a message board called Wizard Chan of harassment. Let me run you through the events. There were two derogatory posts made about her coming from a single IP address that had never previously posted on the forum, calling her to come to the message board. Someone conveniently passed her the message. She then actively went to Wizard Chan, screen capped the messages, and posted them on Twitter. Zoe Quinn later claimed that she received phone calls specifically from members of Wizard Chan claiming that they were calling her while masturbating. No evidence of this existed exists and no police report was made. Weird how things start to sound a lot less plausible when you simply state the facts instead of reading tweets. Now it gets weirder because Wizard Chan was a forum for lonely depressed virgins that kind of lived by the meme that they would turn into wizards at age 30. One would call them incels nowadays though they firmly rejected the involuntary nature of their predicament. Additionally one of the rules was no girls allowed because of course the majority of the members were anxious around woman. Naturally, one would wonder why depressed anxious men with a no girls code would then invite a girl over to their message board. Now members of Wizard Chan were certainly harassed as a result of Zoe Quinn's accusations. Zoe Quinn's claims were not investigated in any way out of the seven gaming media establishments that ran the story and they never made any effort to contact anyone at Wizard Chan. Only the escapists would formally apologize approximately a year later. I'll also underline that this investigation was carried out by gamers that were doing the journalistic work that paid journalists should have been doing a year prior. Of course the irony being that the fame of a game about spreading awareness about depression is built on the harassment of depressed people driven by an unverified allegation and propagated by lazy journalists. I'd like to repeat Kyle Orland aka Batman. Where is the line? To quote between the harassers and the victims of harassment, end quote. Now, I'm not privy to the Games Journal Pro emails at the time of the incident, but I wonder if there was any empathy for the actual human beings that were members of the Wizard Chan forums. I am of the opinion that they were just a story. I'm pointing this out not because I think these journalists were evil people. I don't really think or care about them, to be frank. They live halfway around the world in a seemingly different reality to mine, and this was a long time ago. I think even if you feel passionate for or against these people, it's okay to move on and let sleeping dogs lie. My analysis is simply the only way I have to explain how incredibly rotten things were. You could claim that there was technically no legal fault, right? But like, it's like defining gambling as surprise mechanics. In my opinion, if you tell yourself that this wasn't a dangerous echo chamber that intentionally or otherwise worked to promote and demote certain narratives, then you are delusional. And I think it would have been okay if the discussions were more professional and based more around facts and reasoning, but they weren't. They were far more governed by dogpiling on whoever didn't have the right opinion and, well, circle jerking. 
If you want to read more about this, Ryan Smith, who was part of the group, wrote two articles about gaming journalism and his time as part of the Games Journal Pro group. I will quote this part of his article, which serves as the response of the Games Journal Pro buddies, just in case you thought that this was a group shaped around camaraderie. To quote, One said, I was fueling harassment and threats. Some blocked me on Twitter. Others tried contacting my colleagues or editors in an attempt to shame me into silence or have my boss silence me, end quote. Now, is there more in the Games Journal Pro emails that we didn't see? Yes, it was about four years worth of emails, which Greg Teeter refused to comment on in an interview with Total Biscuit, Eric Kane, and Janelle Bonanno. Make of that what you will. The email group was deleted, Kyle Orland issued an official apology, and most of the major gaming websites formally adjusted their ethics and guidelines after they were caught playing the sausage, so to speak. Now, in defense of the journalists, there was never a cabal or a puppet master as some gamer gators were conjuring in tinfoil hats. Gamers are not investigators, or at least most of us aren't. What is also true is that some people said and did some horrible things, and I think it's natural to want to push back rather than to be introspective. I personally see that in Greg Tito, especially when he was grappling with how to handle the discussions on the escapist forums. Okay, so Zoe Quinn and Nathan Grayson was a dead end or at least there was nothing to verify. Games Journal Pro was certainly rotten, but not the pay dirt that gamers needed to get true reform. The question then remains, was Gamergate worth it, or did a bunch of people suffer for nothing? Yes and no. Gamergate did get a lot of gaming journalism to at least alter some of their front-facing ethics. Many of the articles written had to be revised to disclose conflicts of interest, and in that, many journalists and devs were found to be living in each other's pockets. Patricia Hernandez comes to mind. It was also found that Lee Alexander, who wrote the first of the Gamers Are Dead articles, was friends with Zoe Quinn. Ethically, she had a responsibility to recuse herself. Gamergate is reported with supporting evidence over over 100 allegations of journalists giving positive press to friends without disclosure, sending money to people they were reporting on, caught in contradicting statements in attempts to minimize foul play, and more. While Nathan Grayson was technically not caught in his relationship with Zoe Quinn, he was caught giving positive press without disclosure of his relationship with our favorite Twitter user, Lego Butts. Most notably, the Gamergate discussions on Reddit prompted a whistleblower to give his account about how EA was hacked, compromising 40,000 accounts. There was no coverage on this because the EA PR and the journalists were in cahoots. This Reddit user was later verified by a Cinema Blend article where a journalist investigated the claim and found it to be true. One harder to prove claim is that Gamergate is somewhat responsible for the FTC law that requires the disclosure of sponsored content that we see today. Now, all of this being said, uncovering all of this and cleaning house, so to speak, certainly came at great loss in the sense of all the nastiness. It also came at a great loss in reputation. I mean, consider this, someone called me a sad remnant of Gamergate in one of my previous videos. How is it that people are still trying to use the word as a derogatory term? Think about how bad the sources of the Wikipedia page are. Even in researching this, I have no problem finding anti-Gamergate sentiment online, but a lot of the evidence that supports Gamergate is dead link after dead link after dead link. The effects of the censorship efforts at the time are very much still there, and it really does mean that if you have a positive opinion of the Gamergate movement, you are going to be treated as a misogynist. It also didn't fundamentally fix the underlying problem, and I believe that this is why we are on the precipice of Gamergate 2. Allow me to explain. Ryan Smith was right. There is no mustache twirling villain behind the curtain, just a bunch of clowns. The problem is the echo chamber itself. All of this to say that the game's journalism, and we'll talk about DEI in a moment, it suffers from a lack of ideological and geographical diversity. The collective voice of games media is predominantly American, and I don't think that it's a stretch at this point to say that it has a liberal bias, in particular towards third and fourth wave feminism. By the way, feminists are in debate as to whether there is a fourth wave. This is all fine, except video games aren't just being sold to American third and fourth wave feminists. In 2020, Pew Research Center released this study titled, 61% of US women say feminist describes them well. Many see feminism as empowering, polarizing. Well, that seems like a lot of people, but if you read the article, it shows the graph that tells you that the majority of the 61% only admit to feminism somewhat describing them. 
Furthermore, to quote, Notably, many of those who identify as feminists are critical of the feminist movement. For example, 43% of adults who say feminism describes them very or somewhat well also say feminism is polarizing and 45% would not describe it as inclusive. End quote. You cannot make this up. Away from their screens, away from Twitter, in the real world, this is what people think. Almost 50% of people who relate to feminism do not agree that feminism is currently an inclusive movement. And this is only in the USA. That statistic is going to go up once you start including other countries. Remembering that a lot of our video game entertainment does, in fact, come from Japan and now China. Almost forgot about Korea. In reality, it would be far more accurate to say that the majority of gamers are egalitarian, defined as believing in or based on the principle that all people are equal and deserve equal rights and opportunities. By the way, just in case you think there can be no problem with reporting with a feminist bias, here's an example of an established games media reporting that a female gamer was kicked out of esports. Here's what they said, to quote, Esports is not a meritocracy. It's a male-dominated scene in which gender essentialism runs rampant and in which games are often made to feel unwelcome. Even in a game as ostensibly inclusive as Overwatch, a woman can't be just a player, not without ample infrastructural support from an understanding team and Ellie's situation exemplifies why." End quote. So that would be cool and all, except the journalist never researched the story before asserting their bias. What actually happened was the player in question was a guy who was catfishing by having a girl named Ellie sitting next to him with a mic. Ellie later admitted this herself. All this does is minimize any possible issue that might actually exist with sexism in esports damage the reputation of the establishment that reports fall under and in turn forces gamers to be more suspicious of women in games because the reporting is not accurate. I want to speak directly to game journalists here. This is hurtful to our community. This kind of reporting is breeding sexism and I think I speak on behalf of all gamers when I say, we don't want this. And saying, oops sorry, it isn't good enough. We want sexism less than you do. The station of journalists in every sector in the Western world has been in decline since 2008. Journalism has always been left-leaning, but this lean is accelerating with the decline as competition goes up and wages go down compared to living costs. We are seeing these peacocking displays of left-leaning radical ideologies sink deeper and deeper in depravity as they fight for the scraps. It's not just games journalists, but games journalism is especially bad, exactly because gaming is so welcoming to the sharing of ideas. It has a low barrier to entry and well, you don't have to be a real journalist to do it. You can seethe over media literacy, you can complain that gamers don't value your ideals, but you work for us. When Stellar Blade skyrockets to the top of pre-orders, that is your boss telling you that you are wrong. The numbers don't lie. Whatever your concept of what your art is, it's not going to change the fact that one of the most important roles of journalism is to uncover corruption and hold the powers that be to an account for the sake of the common folk. That includes other journalists, that includes people you like, that includes people that support your personal political beliefs. And this is supposed to be your function not because of your beliefs, but in spite of them. So, if you don't want to write 50 guides a week, protect our financial interests. Tell us something new, tell us something with integrity, tell us something that can't be written by ChatGPT. And then maybe, just maybe, your opinions will be worth a damn. To the gamers, I know, it's frustrating. All in all, I think most of us just want to be left alone. We just want to play games. We don't all get along. We don't all agree. But by the definition of our hobby and the statistics that back it, we are not violent in our actions. And there's no scientific evidence to say that gaming makes you a misogynist. No one should be oppressed by that message. Ultimately, every year, millions of new gamers are born. Someone gets their first console. Someone shows their friend a game. Someone comes back to the hobby and they still think that Blizzard is the gold standard, yada 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 yada. The power dynamic between the games industry and the consumer as a whole is asymmetric. As the customer, we only have two buttons, complain and boycott. Neither of these work if there's no cohesion. And we know there isn't true cohesion because if there was, pre-orders would not exist. 
but they do. We are a messy pile of contradictions that are really just trying to find a way to wind down after work, a way to cope with our daily lives, a way to kill time with friends, a way to lucid dream. So what can we actually do about our current situation with Sweet Baby Inc. and DEI after taking in everything that happened in 2014 to 2015? Well, you'll do whatever you'll do, but here's what I think. Boycott games you don't want to see. This is our right as the customer. Protect the rights of your fellow customers, even if you don't agree with them. Keep talking about abusable diversity, equity and inclusion policies, games journalism and other broken practices that are choking our hobby. Be specific. Don't use phrases like woke ideology, though I admit the convenience it's far too nebulous. It's really falling into the same trap that feminist terminology falls under. Use plain English and more people will understand what you're saying. Don't attribute to malice what you can attribute to incompetence, but do apply pressure for further investigation. Failing that, there are no rules to say that you cannot conduct your own investigation. Try not to sound like a conspiracy theorist, because that's a turn off for most people. Talk about the inaccuracy of the Gamergate Wikipedia page. It's currently being updated as we speak with attempts to link gaming to alt-right recruitment. This has been happening since Gamergate itself. It was updated again to link Gamergate to Trump and it is being updated right now to frame gamers as harassing Sweet Baby Inc. We need to remember that this is where the people that ultimately vote on the laws we are bound by get their information. I think one of the biggest advantages that we have today as the customer is that we are far more connected to each other. I think we as gamers are more educated on how scams work than we ever were back then. We're also far more conscious of how systems with good intentions can be appropriated for corrupt means. Overall, I think gamers are handling the current controversies far more gracefully than in 2014 and I think that's something worth noting. Again, you don't have to listen to me, this is just my opinion. Do what is best for you and your families. Anyways, I hope you learned something. I hope that knowing what happened in the past has equipped you for the problems that we are facing now and the problems that I believe that we will be facing in the future. We'll be tackling current events in the next episode so strap yourselves in because we're going to be seeing some familiar faces. Take care and we'll talk again real soon.